Inside America's Boardrooms, the informational show for board members and corporate secretaries. Brought to you with Knowledge Partners, Diligent, PwC, Center for Audit Quality, the Conference Board, and Corporate Board Member. Along with content contributors, Equilar, Meridian Compensation Partners, Wilson Sonsini Goodrich and Rosati, Donnelly Financial Solutions, and the Society for Corporate Governance. Welcome to this edition of Inside America's Boardrooms. I'm T.K. Kerstetter, the CEO of Boardroom Resources and the co-founder and editor-at-large of Corporate Board Member Magazine. Uh, we're here at Corporate Board Member's annual Boardroom Summit, and we're having the opportunity to have some um, uh, very uh, famous guests, and this morning we're happy to have the world-renowned uh, business advisor, speaker, and author of Boards That Lead. Um, he also serves on six boards internationally, uh, chairman of one, and it's my pleasure to introduce Ram Sharan. I'm delighted to be here and share some good ideas and what are the issues coming in the future. Well, Thanks, TK. We've got, uh, I think a great topic would be what you're going to speak on today. And uh, while we only have 10 minutes, and uh, that's going to be tough to summarize, the topic is really great, and it's what makes great boards great? I think this is a great topic. The first thing every company has to consider, a board can be a competitive advantage. It can also be a competitive disadvantage. We know many boards that have actually failed. These are publicly held companies. You have companies that have failed. They don't fail, they fail because the boards and the CEOs let them die. We have difficulties at Yahoo. We have those examples all over the place. This morning, you're looking at Sears. It is absolutely declining. So here, the first part of the board is we must think about how the board adds value and how the board becomes competitive advantage. If it is not, your board is a ceremonial board, it just rubber stamps, and you're not using these fantastic resources that can take a company to the next level. There are boards that are fantastic in adding value, and they create value. So I like to share with you my observations uh, because I chair some boards. I am on six boards today, one in Brazil, two in India, one in China, one in Turkey, one in the United States. And they're all in different industries. Having written five books on boards and doing the research from Harvard Business School some time ago, here are the five items I like each company, each board, to really take home and evaluate where your board is and where your board needs to be. Then I'll come back, how do you get the boards to do that? The first one that adds the value and compared wanted, you need to define what is the criteria to be an outstanding board. Most people talk about what inputs the board makes. That's good. What we need to focus on what is the output of the board? Most people don't invest time on that. So board makes only a very few decisions. And if those decisions are great, this company will prosper. If those decisions are terrible, by omission or by commission, the company will suffer. So the first decision that a board makes is to have the right CEO at all times. So the board needs to be constructive. Board needs to understand how do we help existing CEO become better or be able to detect if the CEO is not really performing, how quickly we can help that person or on the other hand, come to a decision to make a change. Companies die because this decision 
is either delayed, not faced, or the board makes a big error in selecting a new CEO. This morning, in the newspapers, it's announced a change in the CEO for Mattel. Remember Mattel, the doll? They took the CEO out roughly 18 months ago. Not quite, actually, 14 months ago. Recruited a new one. Now she's leaving. And the performance has not been very good. So this board needs to focus on to get the right captain of the ship. And it is a worldwide brand. And in this brand, this decision is not quite in the last two or three rounds as it should be. So you can make all the inputs to the board, all the meetings you have, but your board composition has to be such that it is constructive, it is helpful, it also detects when there's a mismatch in the CEO and his team and the requirements of the company. So we have examples of that kind all over the place where some decisions are good, some decisions are not very good. It happened at Avon, the Avon lady, the cosmetic firm, fantastic brand worldwide, and they're making a change again. So the board's number one decision is that one. There are early warning signals when the CEO DNA does not match with the change, then the board has to really work through what's really, really happening. So that's the first one. And there is no other second that matches this decision and this work. Now, how do you do that? I'll take that question right now. And that is, in a board, usually there are six board meetings. Some have four. These board members usually, minimum six board members, sometimes eight, sometimes 10. Beyond that, it's very difficult to manage. In this board, you have to have people who understand people, who understand CEOs, who understand the strategy, who understand the outside world, and who focus on to ask the CEO to share what is on his mind, what is on her mind, how do we help? If the performance is slipping, then they got to create a trustworthy relationship to know why it is slipping. But all board members, bar none, must get information of what is happening at the consumer, what is happening at the employee level, and what is happening to the competition, and what is happening to the technology level. If they don't understand that, they will make a decision when it is too late. So that's the first part they need to do. The second part of the board adds value is to learn the business model, how the business makes money. In the digital age, no company, non-digital, is going to escape that their money making is going to change. It's changing very fast. It will change again. In many cases, the changes are much faster than the organizations are able to change. So we see in the newspapers about the staple consumer companies, like the PNGs, like the Ricketts, like the Unilevers, like the, 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 the Nestle's. And their growth, real growth, is less than 2%. They have yesterday or so in the newspaper saying they can't have pricing power. In fact, in many categories, the price has declined. So they need to learn, is it managerial problem? Is it industry problem? Is it we missing something what's happening? Everybody knows it, that the advent of Amazon and people coming online, giving the power to the consumer, to check prices. They're able to social media check the quality of the product. And therefore, it is putting pressures on the price of these commodities. Anybody who wants to sell branded products, they have to have a legitimate value creating to the customer differentiation. I have to do it again 
again, again, many companies are not geared for doing that. So that's the second item. The third item is many companies do merger acquisitions. Board can be very helpful in the merger acquisition criteria in helping the CEO figure out how to do it, get the right contacts. But also, they have to be the breaks when not to do it. Because many times, companies have bought something that actually has hurt the whole company. It has happened in many companies. In one company, Warren Buffett was the director. Company had announced to make that decision. And he went to the boardroom in the afternoon and got the board to reverse the decision. So here, these are the things that the board can really help going forward. When you combine money-making model, and when you combine the merger acquisitions, these two combine form strategy. And that strategy part, we must get down from 50,000 feet to 50 feet, but not micromanage. The fourth part is the culture of the company, fraud. The, 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 the violation of the code of conduct. All these things coming out into the open today. The Me Too movement going in. It's going on for decades where the board has been. So the board need to conduct cultural survey. Minimum once a year. Use third parties. Because board itself cannot do it. So they need to know what's happening in the company. What's the energy? What's the culture? What behaviors are good? How do they compare with the competition? What does the consumer actually value? And the last item is the key that just like a farmer gets a seed for the future crop, the board must take accountability to ensure that we have future leaders being developed in the company. They must meet with them. They should see them, see what is the input coming in and how this company create more value. Because value is created by people. People create value. People compete, businesses don't. So they meet six times a year in most cases. They spend usually two days. First half day, they come in, in the afternoon and they do committees. Committees do a lot of work. Next day, they are about six hours for the whole board meeting. So there are 36 hours of face-to-face -face board meeting. They need to plan a 12-month agenda, what three, four items they're going to discuss in depth, and what is the return on their time. Now to do all that, the most critical decision is the composition of the board. Who is the chairperson, lead director, chair of the committees? If those are not very good, the board is not going to work. The other part of the board is it has to be ever refreshing board because the, con the, the, the change is very continuous and there is an obsolescence of board members. So if they are not in tune with the outside world, they can't do very much. So take heart, plan three years ahead of time, who should be the lead director, who should be the chairperson, who should be the chair of the committees. Get the best board that make those five decisions very well. So, Ram, um, we know how important it is to, to select the right CEO. Tell me your views on how the board should be led, though. Uh, how important it is, is it to have board leadership in a board where somebody is assuming that responsibility? First, we must conduct the annual survey of board effectiveness, usually done by third parties. It also has a peer review of the board. The peer review of the board is to see contribution, no contribution. Number two, the lead director or the chairperson who is an outsider must do three-year planning with the governance committee. What skills will we need? Which ones we will not need? Should discuss in the governance committee. Should point out the whole analysis and then reach those directors at least a year ahead of time and say, this is what is needed and we will not be needing you because this is not going to fit. Most directors will understand that. And I'm really looking forward to your full presentation today, and I want to thank you for taking the time to come and share 
those five key points about what makes boards, what makes great boards great. So thank you for your time. And that will conclude this edition of Inside America's Boardroom. We hope you enjoyed the show. We'll be back again next week when we take another look at a critical topic that'll help you be a better board member or committee member. So we'll see you then. Join us again next week for Inside America's Boardrooms. Brought to you with knowledge partners, Diligent, PwC, Center for Audit Quality, the Conference Board, and Corporate Board Members along with content contributors, Equilar, Meridian Compensation Partners, Wilson Sonsini Goodrich and Rosati, Donnelly Financial Solutions, and the Society for Corporate Governance.